Dios. I, I believe the Holy Spirit is ministering in this moment. Someone didn't open up their mouths in the Holy Spirit and in this moment is reminding you. He, he's reminding you how he made a way out of no way. He's reminding you that you could have been dead. He's reminding you this morning. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I don't know who I'm waiting on. I don't know. This minute is for you to shout. I can remember looking out and seeing that the plane was 30,000 feet in the air, but nothing but water. If I think about what could have happened, but as I thank God, because I understand there was a pilot, but I didn't look at that pilot. I, 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 I remember that I believed God, 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 the keeper of my life the bishop of my soul, the author and the finisher of my faith, my bright morning star, my rock, the prince of peace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let us go into the word of God. Today we are talking about life. And let me tell you how I define life this morning. I say that life is living intentionally for eternity. Living intentionally for eternity. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have life everlasting. The foundation scripture that I begin with this morning is John 10 and 10. It's a familiar, uh, familiar scripture to some. But all this morning, there are a lot of scriptures that I will be going through, and I do pray that this is a message um, that just doesn't fall on your ears today, but that from the notes that you take and the scriptures that I reference, that you will use these scriptures in your devotion time this week. Because I think that all of us need a time in life that we are reflecting on our life. How are we thinking about life as it is right now? What is our perspective on what we are going through? Are we trusting God? Are we believing in God? Are we holding on to the word of God? And so I begin today as I talk about life, John 10 and 10 from the Amplified. It'll be the Amplified all day today. Um, the thief comes only in order to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. I want to know, are you ready for some overflow? Because Jesus says that's why he came, that you might have life, that you might enjoy life, and that you might live it to the full until it overflows. I think that's a, 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 a good spot to say, thank you, Jesus. I came that you might have life. Father God, in the name of Jesus, as we come today, we thank you for your word. We are ready, Lord. We are ready. Speak now. I pray that our worship of you has been acceptable. I pray that the praises have joined in with the praises around your throne this morning. I am praying now, Father, that the Holy Spirit, that you would come and have your way, that the words that are spoken out of my mouth, that they will go forth and do what you intended them to do. And then I believe your word that says they will not come back void. And so I thank you in advance for you will write the word upon our hearts 
so that when we leave this place, we will not only be hearers of the word, but we will be doers of the word. And that we will speak your word, that we might have life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. So as I come and I, and I thank you all for all of the prayers that went up for me and Kalia as we traveled to Africa, it was a great trip and trust me, throughout the next few sermons you will be hearing about Africa. And, and so I will take the sermons to give you my reflections of uh, my experience in Africa. And so I begin with this sermon as I talk about life. What is life? Uh, I say to you today that it's not just as simple as believing that living is the opposite of being dead because we know that there are people who are living who are dead. And, and so life is greater than that. Um, I, I look to the Greek and what is the Greek word for uh, life and that is Zoe. And if we look at the Greek definition of life, it, it says that it is real, it is genuine, it is active, it is vigorous, it is a life that is devoted to God. That is life, a life that is devoted to God. It's a life filled with blessings. It's a life that um, guarantees that you have blessings on this side and you have blessings on the other side into eternity. It, it's life. Uh, so my first reflection in Africa is being on a safari. And so in the Jeep, we are in the safari and, you know, we see the zebras, we see the rhinos, we see the hippopotamus, how you say, hippo, hippopotamus. Um, did I say it right? Hippopotamus, hippopotamus, hippopotamus. The hippo. So the hippo. Um, you know, the ostrich, the lions wouldn't come out, so we didn't see the lions. Um, uh, oh, but I, I happened when one of the stops as we're looking at the elephants, we saw the elephants and this is where I had the thought and I said, do I want to trade my life for their life? Because their life, there are no bills, there's no budget, there's no deadlines. Their life, it looks as though, you know, they fall asleep when they want to, they awaken when they want to, they graze all day long, eating when they want to. Um, the only concern they have is predators, but uh, you know, if you're tired of paying bills, and would you trade your life for their life? And so as I thought about it, and I think of, and I thought about life, I said, would I really, even though I wouldn't have to do, wouldn't worry about a mortgage, wouldn't worry about any of those things, not be concerned about it, a car breaking down, they don't be concerned about those things, um, you know. So, so what I trade my life. Then I thought about it, I love to laugh. I said, I wonder if they have they ever experienced laughter. Mm -hmm. Do they know the feeling of what, how it feels to be tickled and, and, and then laugh? Mm -hmm. I love laughter. I can't think about, I, I couldn't think about giving that up. And then I said, well, do they really know loving relationships? Do they know what it feels like to be loved or to give love? Would I trade up, trade off being able to sleep when I wanted to sleep, awaken and having food, not ever worrying about how I look? Would I give it up to not experience love? Now, I know instinctively they, are, they protect. They protect their children. They protect their territory. But do they know love? Do they know love? And then I had some other thoughts, and I got to the thought, do they ever experience and know they're experiencing the presence of God? Would I give up experiencing God to never worry about a bill again. Would I give it up? Is that life? And, and I believe today, as I stand here, I can honestly say, though there may be some benefits they have, but to know God, to feel the presence of God around you and in you, 
to know that you are a child of God, to, to know Jesus and what he has done, what, what would you trade for it? I don't believe that I would trade my life for the elephant's life. I believe that as a child of God, there's some greatness and some, some awesome benefits that we have as we live this life. And so today I say to you that our life is about being connected to Jesus. And so in the book of John, and get ready because I'm going to go through some scriptures, some uh, references here, because John talks a lot about life. He quotes Jesus a lot about what Jesus said about life. And so go with me now as we journey through some scriptures. Uh, the first one that I go to is in John chapter 6, verse 35. The word says, Jesus replied to them and said, I am the bread of life. The one who comes to me will never be hungry. And the one who believes in me as Savior will never be thirsty. For that one will be sustained spiritually. Here Jesus, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And we're connected to Jesus. He says, the one who comes to me will never be hungry. Will never be thirsty. Then I go a few chapters over and I go to chapter 8, verse 12. And it says, once more, Jesus addressed the crowd. He said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life, the one who follows me. Then I go a few more chapters over. I got to chapter 10. I came that they may have life and enjoy life and have it in abundance. Then I go to the next chapter. John 11, and I get to verses 25 and 26, and you know the story of Lazarus, and, and he says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in, adheres to, trust in, relies on me, hmm. he says, will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me as Savior will never die. He says, do you believe this? He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Then I go a few chapters over to chapter 14. And I get to verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the only way to God and the real truth, and the real life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He says, I am the real life. Then go a few chapters over, and I go to chapter 20. And this is John as he's getting ready to close his letter. He says, but these have been written so that you may believe with a deep abiding trust that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed, the Son of God, and that by believing and trusting in and relying on him, you may have life in his name. So I sum all of that up, and I say, what is life? Our lives are about being connected to life. I, I don't know if you think about a, a, a life support system, that when somebody is on life support, they are connected to that machine. And it is that machine that gives them, that is assisting them in their breathing and in their living. It is the same way that should be our relationship with God that there is no life for us apart from Jesus, that our life is connected to him. He is the source of our life. He is the source of our being. So then I say, well, let's look at how we sometimes look at life. 
Sometimes we look at life and we see problems and we believe that the problem uh, of why we're not feeling happy, the problem of why we don't have any joy, the problem of why we can't get content, the problem of why we see everything from a victim standpoint, a negative standpoint, why is it? We look at people and we look at circumstances. I want to submit to you today that where we should look is our connection to Jesus. Because if we look at our connection to Jesus and we are connected to the source of life, he says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That if we are connected to Jesus, then he's the source of everything that we need in life. And so therefore, if we need joy, we, we, we can't depend on other people giving us joy. We can't depend on other people to make us happy. We can't depend on other people to complete us. We can't depend on other people to make us whole. It is the source and we have to be connected to Jesus. And so we have to ask ourselves, if I'm not feeling good about my life right now, is it because there is something wrong with my connection? Is there something in my surrender to God? Is there something in my acceptance of, of God's way? Is there a problem in my acceptance of God's plan? Is it because I just don't trust God with my life? Is that the reason why? Because if we trust God, the creator of the universe, the source of everything, then we have to believe that we're in the palm of his hand and that he is keeping us and he is sustaining us. He says, those who follow me will never be hungry and they will never thirst. Is it our connection? So let me give you another reflection, because maybe we're just not seeing life as it should be. So I have to tell you that my first couple of days in Africa, I was not happy. I was not happy at all. I was so disappointed. I was walking around, sharing my feelings. I'm disappointed. I traveled 20 hours on an airplane only to get to a place that reminds me of home. And so I, I, I said, this, this was the problem. The Africa that I envisioned in my mind was not the Africa that I saw when I landed. I, I, I will say to you that the first day, my daughter, who is just a, a workout fanatic, says, I gotta go find a gym, I have to find a gym. And she gets on the internet and she finds a fitness trainer and he says, come on over, I, can, I got an hour for you, come on over. So I said, well, you know you're not going alone. I don't care if I have to sit there and watch you. I, I'm, you know, I'm going, this is Africa, this is in Atlanta. So, so anyhow, we get there and we're in the gym and the minute we walk in, who do I hear? 50 cents. I said, this can't be Africa. I am not hearing the rhythms of the motherland. I am hearing 50 cent. And so, I, you know, we go to the mall and walking through the mall, where did I feel like I was at? Lenox Mall. Everything's in English, Gucci, all this other stuff, H&M. Um, all, 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 every, all the stores I see in the malls here were there, at, at all of them. And I said, wait a minute, is this Africa? Everybody is speaking English to us. The only thing that was different was the currency. Uh, 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 and I'm saying to myself, oh, this, uh, mm -mm, I, I'm disappointed. This, uh, this, ain't, this is not a good time for me. I didn't even need to go get a shot because we're sitting there, we're staying in Weston and the room is nice. And I'm saying, this can't be the Africa. Where's the hut? Where are the tribes? Where are the 
tribes? Where is the banging? Uh, uh, you know, where? Nothing. So then we have our first night service. So I said, okay, well, maybe there's a different. I walk into the service, and they're singing praise and worship. I knew every song. It was either William Murphy or Tasha Cobb Leonard, and uh, it, 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 uh, they're, they're doing an affirmation at tithing time, and, and I'm saying, wait a minute, 20 hours. <laughs> but I had to get an attitude check because I had 10 more days to go. And so I am either gonna accept that this is Africa, or I'm gonna spend 10 more days pouting. I say to you that it's sometimes that's what we do in life. That if we don't like the life that we are living right now, we get an attitude, we start pouting, and we forget that God has a purpose and a plan. We forget that. So in a moment of conviction, I had to say to myself, what have you been telling people you're going to Africa for? You didn't say you were going to see how Africa looked. You said you were going to Africa on a mission trip. And so is it about mission or is this about you? And so immediately, I, got, I shook my head and got myself together. And I said, this is about mission. This is about being a vessel that God can use to bless other people. And, and so then after I did that attitude check, I could now look at the mountains and look at the oceans and see the awesomeness of God. I, I could now focus on the people that we came to serve. I, I could focus on the little girls and I was asked to stand up and give them a word of encouragement. God use me. I was asked to speak at the conference that Saturday morning. God use me. And, and then the bishop came back and said, listen, I, I need to send you out to preach. Will you go out to preach? God, use me. And so when I get an attitude check and I realize this is not about you, this is, this is about God using you. So all of a sudden, life feels good again. All of a sudden, I'm happy about being in Africa because God has found a way to, give me, to, to allow me to give him some glory. And so it is with our lives. That yes, where you are right now may not be where you want to be. But can God get some glory out of the situation that you are in? Can God use you because somebody's looking at you? Can he use you to testify of his goodness? Can he use you to be the one that he shows somebody that he'll make a way out of no way? And so if we can change our perspective, if we can say, wait a minute, I can't let the fact that life isn't what I want it to be to distract me. I got to keep my eyes on Jesus. Hmm. I think it's that way for those who know the prayer of serenity. Because when you hear the words of the prayer, it changes the focus to not just the people and the places and the circumstances of life, but everything goes back to looking at God. And so if you're distracted today, if you are feeling um, in despair about what's going on in your life, let me read to you Isaiah 26 and 3, because this is where your peace and your joy is. The word says, you will keep in perfect and constant peace the one whose mind is steadfast, that is committed and focused on you in both inclination and character, because he trusts and takes refuge in you with hope and confident expectation, our lives and our happiness, our contentment, and our joy is all about being connected to Jesus and keeping our mind focused on him. 
And, and so I say that what we have to do, if we're not feeling good about where we are and what's going on and, and, and you don't have any good thing to say about life, I say examine your thoughts. Is your mind on your money and your money on your mind? You can't focus on Jesus because you're focusing on your money. Is your mind constantly thinking about seeking pleasure? If you're seeking pleasure, it's not focused on Jesus. Ear, uh, let me say it. Are you constantly tripping? Do people say to you constantly, consistently, girl, you're tripping. You just tripping. Now think about tripping. If you ever had a fuse blow in, in your house and you had to go to the fuse panel and you had to, you know, tri it tripped and you had to reset it. Now, after you do that a couple of times, you say, wait a minute, there must be a bad connection in the house. Because if this fuse keeps blowing and I got to constantly reset it, there's a connection that is not strong. It's not good. So it is with us. If we're constantly tripping about life, if we're constantly in despair, if we're constantly and consistently unhappy, we better check our connection. Because the word of God says, if you keep your mind focused on him, he will keep you in perfect peace. Perfect peace. We just have too many distractions. But I say to you that if, if you can just keep your focus on Jesus and his word, because there are thousands upon thousands of promises in the word of God that will get you through each and every day of your life, each and every day. So that's why when we get to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, this is what the word says. For his divine power has bestowed on us absolutely everything necessary for a dynamic spiritual life in godliness. You might be used to hearing he has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. In Jesus is everything that we need for life. Where do we find our comfort? We find it in him. Where do we find our hope? We find it in him. Where do we find provision? We find provision in him. Where do we find unconditional love? We find unconditional love in him. And everything that we need in life is, our, is about our connection to Jesus, who is the source of life, of life. I, it was sad that I was talking to a friend of mine in Connecticut, and um, he's a deacon in his church, and he said just a few weeks ago that one of the deacons, one of their deacons, committed suicide. And he said, but uh, it's a friend, so he said, Marion, we as deacons, once a month, we pray all night together and go to breakfast. He said, never did we know that this man was struggling with life. And sometimes we get so ashamed of where we are. But sometimes we all need help to get plugged in again. And so I want to encourage you today that as I'm talking about life, as I'm speaking about life, and you're saying, but my life is messed up. I'm saying to you today, just get somebody. That's what the body of Christ is about. That if you feel unplugged, that there's a brother or sister that will help you get plugged in again. But we got to get over the shame. Elijah, a great prophet of God, had a moment of depression. Jesus had a moment in the Garden of Gethsemane where he said, Father, can, can, can I get out of this? Can this pass from, from me? So, I mean, it, 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 don't feel ashamed of the feeling of despair. Just don't stay there. Just don't stay there. And so that's why in, in our wall, in our home, we didn't go to church, but my mother believed in God, and she had this prayer for serenity on the wall. 
And it said, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now, that was all that she had on her plaque, but the, actually the prayer goes on. It says, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you, Jesus, will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and extremely or supremely happy with you forever. And so that's the prayer that kind of settles you, that says, okay, let, let me shake my head and let me remember that it is all about Jesus and I trust him with my life. So I question today, because as I think about it, I'm going to go back to Genesis, the origin of life. Where do we get the breath of life to be able to breathe? and say it is well with my soul, no matter what is going on. Like the woman who didn't know was planning to commit suicide in the word and the prophet said, how are you? She said, all is well. And so Genesis 2 chapter four, I mean Genesis chapter two verse four, gives us the origin of life says, this is the history of the origin of the heavens and the earth when they were created in a day that is the days of creation. That the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub or plant of the field was yet in the earth and no herb of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth and there was no man to cultivate the ground. But a mist, a fog, a dew, a vapor used to rise from the land and water the entire surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed, created the body of man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being, an individual complete in body and spirit. He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Has every, anybody ever been breathed on by God? Has God put breath inside of you? The breath of God. I, 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 it, it amazed me. I, how many times have I read this and then something hit me? The breath of God is what gives us life, the breath of God. And do we have the breath of God on the inside of us? Let me take you to John chapter 20, verses 19 through 22. The breath of God. What is the breath of God that gives life? So when it was evening on the same day, the first day of the week, though the disciples were meeting behind barred doors for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. So Jesus has been resurrected, but he has not ascended yet. And he said, peace be to you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with great joy, joy connected to Jesus. Then Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the Father has sent me, I send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the breath of life within us. It is our connection and our walk and our surrender to the Holy Spirit that gives us this breath of life, this life that God has put on the inside of us. But I want to submit to you today that spiritually there are many of us 
that are holding our breath. In the physical, if you hold your breath, you can't do it but so long. Try it. If you hold your breath, if you don't listen to your body that says, I, I, we need some air, we need, we need some air, we need air right now, then you will die. I believe that there is some of us that have lost our connection, are not recognizing, not living the spirit-filled life. So in the spiritual, we are holding our breath. And I just need to say to someone today, just breathe. Just breathe. Just be confident that God has you. Just be confident that your life is in the palm of his hand. Be confident that the word is true. Just, just breathe. You're spending too much time looking at your circumstances and thinking about what should have been, what isn't, what it could have been, the people who are there, the people who aren't there in your life. You're spending too much time and you're, you're spiritually holding your breath and you just won't breathe. And you just got to breathe. You have to breathe and say, all is well. You have to breathe and say, he is my peace. You breathe and you say, he is my joy. You breathe and say, he is my rock. You breathe and you say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. But you got to stop holding your breath and allow God to breathe on you. It's the breath of God. We say we need a breath of fresh air. I'm saying to you, you just need to know that God is breathing on you. He who is the source of life is breathing on you. He that is the source of life is giving you breath each and every day for you to get up and keep moving. He is the source of your strength. He is your reason for being. He is the one that gives you purpose in life, that sustains your life, that keeps your life, that redeems your life. It is him. So if we keep our connection strong with him, then we have life. So I said life is living intentionally for eternity. So let me get you to the other side of now. Let me show you a glimpse of eternity. I'll close with Revelation uh, chapter 21, verses 22 through 27. John the Revelator gives us a glimpse of eternity. He says, I saw no temple, no churches, saw no temple in it. For the Lord, the God Almighty, the omnipotent, the ruler of all, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of sun nor of the moon to give light to it. For the glory, the splendor, the radiance of God has illuminated it. And the Lamb is its lamp and light. The nations, the redeemed people from the earth. Can you say that's me? will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring into it their glory. It says by day there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed in fear of evil. They will bring glory, um, splendor, majesty, and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing that defiles or profanes or unwashed will ever enter it, nor anyone who practices abominations, detestable, morally repugnant things. And lying, nobody who lies will be in there. But only those will be admitted whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. Now let me tell you, when I got to that part, the Lamb's book of life, I said to myself, why isn't it called the book of the saved? Why isn't it called the book of the redeemed? Why isn't it called the book of the justified? Jesus makes a point to call it the book of life. 
It is for those who have accepted their life in Jesus. It is for those who trust Jesus with their life. It is for those who believe that Jesus can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, how he wants to do it. It is for those who have surrendered their lives to Jesus. It is called the book of life. Life. And so I ask you today, have you truly surrendered your life to him? Are you truly sure your connection is strong and that you are plugged in with Jesus? Because i tell you a way you know. Because however great your worship is, however great your praise is, says how much focus you put on him. And so I, I challenge you to ask yourself in a 24-hour day how Focused am I on Jesus? In a 24-hour day, how many hours did you spend thinking about Jesus? Spending time with your mind focused on him? I will tell you that if you only spend a small time focused on Jesus, if you only praise him when you get up, God, thank you for giving me this day. Thank you for the breath that I have. Thank you for this brand new day. And you don't think of him for the rest of the day? I have, I, I, I'm not surprised that life keeps you on a roller coaster. It's the book of life because he's looking for the people who have given to him their life life and so I close with prayer because when you get to Psalm 150 the last Psalm it says let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord so for those of you who believe that God has already breathed that his breath has already put life into you that I say we give him praise. That we close giving him praise. But we praise him for his goodness. We praise him for his loving kindness. We praise him for his faithfulness. We praise him for exchanging his life with ours. We praise God for our life right now. We thank him for life and life everlasting we give him the highest praise we shout hallelujah to him thank you for life life everlasting we thank you today father that we will never die we thank you that you said we can have life that we can enjoy on this side we thank you today that you said that you've given us life that we might live it to the fullest. We thank you today that through prayer that you said that you would do exceedingly abundantly or super abundantly more than we can ask or think because of your power that is at work within us. We thank you that you will do exceedingly more than what we could ever ask or imagine. And so if we don't understand what's going on, I pray for the comfort of the Holy Spirit that he may come and settle our souls. And if you have given us a charge that where we are is not where we're supposed to be, it doesn't line up with your word, help us to be the world changer that you have called us to be, that we will have the courage to not only change our situation, but change the situations of others. So we thank you today for being our God, the source of our life. We thank you today that we know we have a holy hedge of protection around us for you keep us. We thank you today for being our God. And we humbly say we are proud to be your children. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen.